so uh, good afternoon everyone thank you for coming and uh, hello to everybody on zoom uh, so it is uh, a great honor for CJ and myself to welcome Dr. Shaw Sharis uh, who kindly flew all the way over the pond from the MRC LMB in Cambridge UK uh, to give the international Steambok lectures today, and we're going to get another lecture tomorrow. Um, so Shaw's uh, is is and has been really a pioneer in the field of cryo-EM, uh, with a particular focus on the development of algorithms for image processing, and really pushing forward uh, what is sort of the limit of the technique and and what is currently possible. And so I can give you a, a little bit about his academic background. So I apologize for my Dutch pronunciation here. <laughs> uh, so Schoes did his uh, PhD in Utrecht with Piet Gross. I, tri yeah. I, tri I tried, Piet Gross, okay. And uh, in X-ray crystallography, actually, right? All right. And then I guess he saw the light and, and moved to um, uh, Jose Maria Carazzo's lab in Spain to study cryo-EM and, and develop algorithms for cryo-EM. And in 2010, he was made a group leader at the MRC LMB in Cambridge, sort of the, the premier molecular biology research institute in the UK. And really, he's been the, the, the forefront of the field for, for all those years. Uh, he has many awards, and I'm not going to go through them, but I did see that in 2014, you were one of nature's 10 people that mattered, <laughs> which, that's kind of cool, right? Like, you, you matter, at least for a year. So, that was good. In, in 2021, he was a, a, a Elected a fellow of the Royal Society and uh, has many other awards as well. So Shores is very well known for the development of the program RelyOn, which is the most used cryo-EM processing package. I googled it quickly before I came. There are 20,000 cryo-EM structures in the EMDB, and RelyOn is listed as being the processing package on a little under half of them, and probably it's not listed on some that it was used on. And we're going to use, uh, we're going to hear more about that tomorrow, I believe, and see some atomic resolution cryo-EM maybe. Uh, but today we're going to hear about um, Shaw's exciting work in the in in uh, amyloid fibrils and how he's used cryo-EM to really uncover some really interesting stuff about them. So thank you very much for joining us, Shaw's, and please take it away. Thanks, Tim. So Thank you to you and CJ for the very kind invitation. This is my first post-pandemic uh, international trip for work, so I'd really, uh, I didn't, hadn't realized how much I'd missed all these interactions and just chatting with people about what they do and uh, had a wonderful lunch with the students. Just wanted to say you all matter, uh, no matter what uh, nature says. Uh, okay, so um, my lab, does that not work? Okay, I'll stay here. That did work, you know. All right, don't worry. It changed now. Oh, it did, yeah. Excellent. My lab, uh, as Tim already alluded to, uh, we have kind of two aspects of, of our work. I originally started out after my postdoc with uh, Jose Maria Carazo doing uh, image processing developments also at the LMB, and we write the, the software uh, package called Reliant. So I'll speak more about Reliant uh, tomorrow, and today focus my uh, lecture on, on the other part, on the amyloid uh, structures, where we've looked most mostly a tau and alpha synuclein, but also a few other proteins, which I'll, I'll show you in a minute. So also this work was kind of made possible first through image processing uh, developments, and that's why we're kind of keen to have both an experimental side of the lab and an image processing side of the lab, because they're highly synergistic and you can, you know, you develop methods that make new experiments possible and, and, and your experiments inform on what the kind of new methods you need. And that we like that cycle to, to go on with, with all our colleagues at the LMB, but also specifically in, in our own group. So Shauda, he a, a talented PhD student in the lab, he implemented uh, helical reconstructions uh, algorithms inside uh, Relan, which then made it possible for us to look at these uh, helical filaments. 
So all the work I'll be talking to you about uh, today is done in very close collaboration with uh, Michelle Goodert here, who's a group leader in the neurobiology division of the uh, LMB. So uh, I just walked down the corridor to the other division and uh, have almost daily chats with Michelle. We kind of share the supervision of, of all the students and the postdocs that work on these projects and kind of LMB works slightly different than many universities in that we don't have individual group budgets. We all grab from one very big pot until there is the, the end comes inside and the director tells us, could you grab a bit less? We don't have budgets and so on. And it makes for a very collaborative atmosphere and it also then doesn't really matter whether it's your student or my student. And so it, it, this makes for a very, uh, very nice way to work together. So with Michelle, we've been looking at this protein called uh, tau since uh, 20, end 2015, 2016 or so, and uh, the, the abnormal aggregation of tau into filamentous aggregates characterizes multiple different neurodegenerative diseases. In total, there's more than 20 different diseases, and uh, they are all characterized by accumulation of, of tau filaments. But how they do that and what types of, of neuronal cells and what type of aggregates you get kind of already at the neuropathological level, and this is just from four different diseases, Alzheimer's disease, Pick's disease, progressive succinuclear palsy, and cortical basal degeneration. You already these are all stained for tau in, in black or in, in, in purple here. Uh, already at the kind of cellular level, these diseases look uh, look very different, even though this is always the same protein that that aggregates. Now tau in its normal happy, healthy life is a mostly disordered uh, protein and then it binds to microtubules and is thought to stabilize microtubules. That's kind of uh, as far as people have gotten with understanding what it does. Uh, Liz Kellogg and Ivan Ogala's lab did a beautiful structure of, of tau constructs bound to microtubules, of which of course structures of that uh, Eva is a big expert in. And uh, so there's now some, some idea of how it binds, but that's not what today's talk is about. Uh, because what happens is this mo mostly monomeric unstructured tau, perhaps partially bind bound to microtubules, somehow in disease self-assembles into forming these uh, very long uh, 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 filamentous uh, aggregates. And if you put these in, a, a, in an X-ray beam, then you get this typical, what people have called cross beta diffraction patterns. So in one direction, you get a very strong signal at, at 4.7 angstroms, which is the distance between beta strands and beta sheets. And in the perpendicular direction, at about 10, 10 to 12 angstroms or so, you get a, another peak. And that's more or less the distance that two beta sheets can pack against each other. And that kind of forms this, this X-shaped, uh, 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 cross beta, it's called a diffraction pattern, that arises from these filaments being amyloids in that you have multiple copies of the protein which stack on top of each other to form very long beta sheets which then, because those structures tend to twist and they, you get these helical type of filaments, so there's basically very long beta sheet in this direction and then in each rung of the beta sheet you have uh, uh, one or, or more of these protein molecules but the beta sheets themselves kind of fold over and pack against themselves with this typical cross beta packing, which, which gives rise to this perpendicular signal here. Now then, for many amyloids, only part of the protein sequence forms the ordered core with the beta sheets, and the rest at the, at the end, and, and possibly the C termini, then hangs over and forms what, what Tony Crowder already back in, in the uh, 80s, when he looked at tau filaments extracted from the patients of of, uh, from the brains of patients who died with Alzheimer's disease, he kind of saw what he called the fuzzy coat. So these are disordered uh, parts, either on the end on the C terminal part of the of the of the stable core that just adopt uh, uh, unstructured uh, conformations. Cool. Now. In human brain, you then get uh, six different isoforms of tau, and that's due to uh, alternative splicing of MAPT, the tau gene, and axons two and three can be spliced out or not, and axon 10 here, which encodes for one of the four microtubule binding repeats, and these are more or less homologous repeats that there are four of in the, uh, in the tau sequence that the protein uses to bind to tau, and that's the kind of constructs that, that, that Liz used in 
their structure with the, with the microtubules. So you can get alternative splicing of exon 10, you can splice out the, the second repeat called R2, and then you get, depending on whether these, these two N-terminal uh, exons are spliced out, you get three, uh, four repeat tau isoforms and three three repeat tau isoforms. Now, being a structural biology, and so normally splicing wouldn't really be the first thing on my mind if you think of proteins, but in, in disease there's this interesting observation. If you now look at the biochemistry, you can extract these filaments from, from brain tissue of, of, of patients which, which have died with these different diseases, and it turns out if you've died of Alzheimer's disease or chronic traumatic encephalopathy, the disease that you get after, that you may get if you have repeated brain trauma, for example, from boxing or perhaps American football or so on. I shouldn't say that because I understand the stadium is right next door. But then all six isoforms are uh, uh, accumulated in these uh, filaments. That's not true if you, if you have Pick's disease because then only the three repeat tau isoforms are present in the filaments. And if you have some of the other diseases like, like CBD or PSP, then you get only four repeat tau isoforms in the filaments. So that's kind of interesting already in itself from a biochemical point of view. And then Tony Crowther, as I said, back in the 80s and the 90s, already was working with Michel using the electron microscopy techniques available back then, negative stain and, and, and software that he wrote himself. And, to kind of look at some of these tau filaments. And already just from low resolution negative stain images, he could see that the morphology of the filaments, how wide they are and how much they twist was different among the different diseases. Now much more recent work by, by this Japanese group, they then do limited proteolysis to chip away the unstructured fuzzy coat and then look at with mass spec, see which, which constructs are protected because uh, they would be part of, of the ordered core, and they could see that the, the extent of the ordered cores would be different in some of these different diseases. Now that kind of together with observations that during the progression of disease you have what appears to be a spreading. So the different diseases start in different brain regions and will lead to different early symptoms of the disease. But most of these diseases have in common that you get what appears to be a spreading throughout disease as a disease progresses. So all those observations together then has kind of led to this hypothesis that tau uh, may behave in a way that the prior would do in these neurodegenerative diseases, where you have templated seeding, you have a, a, a filament which which acts, the ends of which acts as kind of little magnets for for otherwise happily disordered protein to to join in and form and grow this filament, and these filaments might then break, and you have more ends, and you get kind of exponential growth and spread of tau throughout the disease, and then perhaps the um, the different isoforms and might might correspond to then forming different structures and then the different structures that would then be like like the uh, different tau uh, strains that people have that's kind of part of the t of the prion hypothesis with different conformations of these filaments then uh, are responsible for different diseases how that would work was completely unclear when we started all this work and uh, after having had when our uh, resolution revolution and more about that uh, tomorrow. The new software developed by Shauda, the new microscopes with the new detectors, we thought it would be a good time in 2016 to go back, look at the same type of filaments that Tony already isolated in the 80s and 90s, and now do uh, modern day cryo-electron microscopy on them. So, um, we started off with the brain of a 74-year-old lady who, here in the US who died of Alzheimer's disease. Back then we would use pretty big chunks of it, uh, cortex region here, and then you can use sarcosyl solubilization and then you can do different steps of centrifugation uh, to, to separate out uh, your filaments from uh, a lot of other stuff that is in brain. And the good thing about imaging is you can re recognize these filaments quite easily in the images. So biochemical chemical purification, you, could, you can kind of be relatively loose because as long as you can see the images and there's not too much muck around it, you can, uh, you can still do pretty good structures. Already Tony in the uh, 80s had identified there is two different types of filaments in Alzheimer's disease. He called these ones paired helical filaments. They are the characteristic kind of wide, narrow, wide, narrow. And these are, uh, he called the straight filaments because they, they lack this uh, alternation of, of width. Thank <laughs> you. 
So we saw the same. This is a negative state image from this brain. Uh, and uh, you can then do, uh, uh, you can make cryo-electron microscopy grids, uh, where you also see here with blue arrows the paired helical filaments, and here is a small piece of, of a straight filament with the green arrow. So using Shouda software, using our uh, back then relatively new cryos with the Falcon 2 detector, I think, or K2, K2 I think it was, uh, we could then calculate structures to about three and a half angstroms resolution for both the paired helical and the straight filaments. And uh, this is just kind of to give you an idea of how this looks like. So this is false colored here of the paired helical and the straight. Now, this is already a projection of the 3D reconstruction, but if there were no noise in the images, uh, then uh, and you would zoom in on this, you would be able to kind of see the, this is the 4.7 angstrom different layers that, that uh, you would get from the beta sheets here. So you can, this is kind of a view, side view of the 3D reconstruction where, where if you then zoom in, if I now turn this over 90 degree, I'm going to look at the filament head on and uh, then I see these two C-shaped uh, protofilaments as we call them and each protofilament on, on, on each layer of this, this beta sheet structure on each beta beta run, as we call it, is one copy of the tau uh, molecule, and, and from the N and the C terminus, as we'll see in a minute, they'll, they'll be sticking out disordered parts, which disappear in our cryo reconstruction because there's no structure there. Now, as we'll see near the end, there's still p potentially a lot of interesting biology, but cryo cannot help you there, and I was discussing with Chad this morning, you know, perhaps uh, NMR could be more useful to study uh, those parts of the filaments. So the straight filament is also made of these the same two C-shaped protofilaments, but whereas there is a symmetry axis here, a helical symmetry axis right down the middle, there is no symmetry here. They pack against each other in an asymmetrical way. Uh, but And because this structure now is more or less as high as it is wide, it, it kind of looks straight in projection. But this structure is much wider than it's high, and then it depends on whether you look at it uh, from the top here or from the side here, whether you get uh, either a, a wide view or a narrow view. So that's kind of, that to, to kind of put you back into the 2D image. So you can uh, zoom in a bit, and this is then the, in blue, the reconstructed density, the three and a half angstrom. That's then of enough detail to be able to recognize the protein sequence and build a, a unique model. So there's only one model that could explain these structures. It starts at valine 306 and uh, ends at phenylalanine 378 and then the 300 up to 305 residues on the N terminal part of this are all floppy and uh, the 70 at the C terminal part are also all floppy in the in the disordered core. And uh, if you look at the straight filament, it's, it's the same two protofilaments, as I said, and they pack against each other in this asymmetric manner, where these four lysines kind of coordinate to this blob of density, which is probably not tau. And as of today, we still don't really know what it is. It's probably some negatively charged molecule, or we don't really know, but to coordinate all the positive charges of the lysines. It could be perhaps post-translational modifications, although we don't see great connections towards them, but it's probably important to keep the straight filament uh, together. You can superimpose them. They're, they're really the, more or less the same C-shaped uh, uh, protofilament structures, and then the kind of structural biologists call it ultrastructural polymorph. So you have the same protofilament that comes together uh, uh, to form two different types of dimers, if you like. Dimer is a strange word, but. Um, now, then, uh, after doing that, then, you, then we got people saying, okay, but this was one lady, right, with Alzheimer's disease. What happens with the, with the next person with Alzheimer's disease? So, in total, we looked at 20 different cases of Alzheimer's disease in negative stain, and we did uh, three more cryo uh, structures from, from three more cases, and they're all the same. Since then, we've looked at even more cases, and, and if you have Alzheimer's disease, there's always PHFs and straight filaments. Sometimes the ratios uh, vary a bit, etc., but uh, they tend to be usually much more PHFs than, than straights, uh, but uh, they're basically always uh, the same. So we think this fault is characteristic of uh, Alzheimer's disease. Now, the extent of the ordered core then explains why you got incorporation of both 
three repeat and four repeat isoforms in these structures, and that is because valine 306 is the first residue in the third microtubule binding repeat, which means that the entirety of the second repeat lies in the fuzzy coat, that lies in that N-terminal part, which is, which is disordered. So whether the second repeat is present or not, it doesn't matter, it's part of the, of the fuzzy code, so you can get indiscriminate incorporation of both three and four repeat tau isoforms. And that kind of um, illustrated on the next slide, um, where, whether you have the orange bit of R2 or not, kind of just doesn't matter and they all get incorporated. Now, what happens then with uh, some of the uh, other diseases? So, if the next one I, I'd like to speak to you is, is chronic traumatic encephalopathy, because that one, as in Alzheimer's disease, had both three and four repeat tau isoforms, and people thought, you know, that probably the filaments from CTE would be uh, possibly the same as the ones from Alzheimer's disease for, for that reason. Biochemically, also, you know, there's limited proteolysis, you wouldn't be able to uh, distinguish them. Probably. So, um, for this, we then used some more uh, advances in Relaon, uh, in a particular. Uh uh, algorithms developed by uh, Jasenko Zivinov to correct for uh, errors that you may have made when you aligned the scope, or in this case, this was data uh, collected at Diamond at the national facility in the UK. Actually, the Thermo Fisher had left certain uh, uh, treffle uh, in, the, in the column, and they came back in, they aligned the column, etc. But Jasenko uh, wrote software to detect this and to correct for it. A little bit more about that tomorrow. But it allowed us to go from 2.7 without correction to 2.3 angstroms. So we looked at three different cases, at three different cases of CTE. One uh, ex-professional American football player and two ex-professional boxers. And as is with Alzheimer's disease, if you have CTE, different individuals with CTE all had the same structures. And again, we saw two different types of structures, so we call this a CTE type 1 structure and this CTE type 2, which we only detected in case uh, one and two, not in case three. But as you can see, the structures are somewhat different from the Alzheimer's disease uh, structures. So actually the extent of the ordered core is very similar. So this one has one, perhaps one more residue at both the N and the C terminus, but otherwise more or less the same. Also the morphology is similar. Uh, and, and I here compare now only the, the protofilament folds. So colored by the same residues, uh, you get more or less a similar topology, but whereas the it was truly C-shaped structure in Alzheimer's disease, in CTE it becomes much more of a straight structure. And also, if, you, if I go back and look at the density, especially here in the 2.3 angstrom map, and this is then where resolution starts to matter, you can see there's, there's a density inside the kind of, of, of the cavity of the loop that fold, where the, the whole fold folds back on itself again. And uh, even even at 2.3 angstroms that does not connect at all to the tau, uh, the, to the density of the side chains for tau, so we don't think this is a post-translational modification. And then looking at the cavity itself, it's all rather either uh, hydrophobic residues or there's two serines in the cavity. So we thought, you know, perhaps there's some sort of hydrophobic cofactor that co-assembles with CTE filaments that might be important to, to kind of determine the difference between the AD fold and the CTE fold. Um, we still don't know to date what this is either, although we're getting more insights, and I'll come back to that near the end. Cool. This pointer is a bit slow. <laughs> now, then what happens to tauopathies where the actual biochemical composition of the filaments are different? So the first uh, other disease we then looked at was uh, Pick's disease, where I told you you only have three repeat tau isoforms which assemble into filaments. So this is a picture of the pick brain that we used, and instead of these kind of raindrop-like tangles, tau tangles in Alzheimer's disease, you have these more like spherical uh, pick body 
disease in the in the in the uh, in the histolo in the neuropathology, the histology here. And uh, again, we saw from the filaments there's two different types: what we call the pick narrow filaments and the wide filaments. And the wide filaments we never got beyond kind of eight or nine angstroms resolution. There weren't too many of them, and they may flop a bit. But for the narrow filament, we got a um, 3.2 angstrom resolution structure. And I hope I can convince you that we probably think that the wide filament is made up of kind of head-to-head -head dimers of the uh, of the narrow filaments. Although we never could build an atomic model for that, we could build an atomic model for the uh, narrow filament, and the density was quite good. Uh, if we look at the uh, assignments, now what is part of the ordered core, it starts here at lysine uh, 254, which is part of R1. And then remember, only three repeat tau isoforms have incorporated in the tau filament. So all the filaments then go straight from lysine 274 to valine 306. So the numbering is a bit confusing here, perhaps, but uh, and that happens then, uh, then right here. But so what you can see now, because part of repeat one is present in the ordered core, you can now compare the, the homology between R1 and R2. Uh, there's, there's these three different residues, and you, if you would try and place a four-repeat tau molecule in this filament, you would get clashes and things wouldn't work out. So again, the, the extent of the ordered core, it now explains the biochemical composition of the filament. So the four-repeat tau molecules would just not, not be able to adopt this type of structure. But of course, overall, this structure now looks disturbingly different from the AD and the CTE structures, right? It's, 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 a, it's a very elongated, we call it kind of J-shaped protofilament, uh, and all the interactions are very different. You know, in, between AD and CTE, there was still some commonality, but that's all out of the window with, with the Pick's disease. Now, since then, uh, we've gone on and we uh, did structures of cortico-basal degeneration and then, la and then we kind of kept doing new diseases and then last year we just decided to do one big paper and kind of put them all together. And that then led to this kind of structure-based classification of tauopathies. So CBD, AGD, PSP, GGT, these are all diseases which have four repeat uh, tau isoforms only in their uh, uh, inclusions. And that is because repeat two, which is always colored in, in, in light blue, is now an intrinsic part of the ordered core. And then you can do the opposite as what we did with PIC. So if you now put three repeat tau isoforms where the R1, which is colored in purple, there would be f residues that just wouldn't fit and then you couldn't, uh, you couldn't form these structures. But you can see there's, there's multiple different structures. They, they have some things in common, right? So there's, there's this, especially the, the CI and the green bit, they kind of look similar topology-wise, but the details always different. So what we found is that distinct tau folds always define distinct diseases. So it's not the opposite. So if you have different diseases, they could have still the same fold. For example, Alzheimer's disease and familiar brainish or Dit Brit British or Danish dementia all have the Alzheimer fold. And the same is true for this fold, which we call the AGD fold. If you have R tag or some, some splicing mutants of, of tau, they also adopt this fold. But distinct structures do always define different uh, diseases. And we now have an explanation of their biochemical composition and uh, we can do this sort of classification where we have a second level of, of kind of, we call this four layer folds and these three layer folds. So PSP and CBD, which based on neuropathology and based on clinical symptoms sometimes had been grouped together, actually much more different from each other at the molecular level than for example, AGD and CBD are. And so these are new findings from, uh, from this kind of classification. Now, also for these diseases, you know, you can look at multiple individuals and they all have the same structure. So the multiple individuals with the same disease all have uh, identical structures. And if you now look, I will, I will kind of point out some of the densities which, which are inside or outside of these filaments, which are not explained by the, by the tau molecule uh, main chain or side chains. So these could be 
other factors like like this hydrophobic potentially hydrophobic cofactor co that we saw in the CTE structure we see a, a potentially hydrophilic cofactor because it's surrounded by lysines inside the CBD fold uh, but also on the outside of the Alzheimer's disease I mentioned the one that holds the, the straight filaments together there's all these densities which are relatively fuzzy they never really connect to tau we're not entirely sure they are, they would be post translational modification some people have tried to claim that based on some mass spec data but we're not we're not convinced at all uh, yet but it could be that that either post translational modifications and or other molecules are important in defining what happens in the different diseases why do you have the same protein with the same sequence adopting all these different structures in these different diseases something specific must be going on Oh, sorry. So these are, this is this was just a. Uh, oh, I went by the cofactor of the CBD. Now, for one of the cases that was was diagnosed as progressive sucrodinucleotide palsy, we did in total seven cases of PSP, and six of them all had the same what we now call PSP fault. But this case had a different structure, and it had a, there's also a cofactor involved. You can see some positively charged residues uh, pointing towards it, but it was different from the uh, PSP structure if you look at it in details. For example, you can see the C-terminal bit in, in red is pointing upwards in the in, in in, in this structure where it's pointing more or less downwards in the PSP structure. So based on that observation and on the observation that um, that until then all, always it held that different folds identified different characterized different diseases we think this meant that we actually identified a, a new disease entity so we then went back to the neuropathologist and the uh, looked back at the clinical profiles and they then thought oh perhaps this case wasn't actually typical PSP and there were some atypical observations especially in the neuropathology and then, so now they're kind of going back and trying to find more cases of what they suspect now is, is, is a new disease. So you can use cryoM to identify new diseases, isn't, isn't that cool? Uh, okay, so <clears throat> similar observations we've now made for for all kind of for different proteins that and so if you have a given disease because tau characterizes all these tauopathies but of course alpha synuclein is uh, characteristic the, the aggregation of alpha synuclein is characteristic for uh, Parkinson's disease dementia with Lewy bodies multiple system atrophy and then for example Alzheimer's disease you also besides the accumulation of tau you also have aggregation of amyloid beta peptides uh, so what we've seen now is that that different individuals with one disease always have the same structures uh, but possibly different diseases are characterized by different structures so for alpha synuclein we looked at uh, five different cases of multiple system atrophy MSA and their, their structures and we saw there's two different types of filaments in, in MSA as well and some individuals only have one and some have only the other and, and in some it's a mixture but MSA is characterized by these type of structures of alpha synuclein when we try to do the same with dementia with Lewy bodies which has alpha synuclein filaments as well we saw the filaments were mostly untwisted and probably different from the MSA although that still needs to be confirmed because we've never been able to solve the structures and then down here very recently this January uh, Yang Yang in the lab she was able to isolate with new extraction procedures uh, bona fide a, a beta 42 peptide filaments from uh, a, a range of different disease brains and if you have sporadic Alzheimer's disease you always you tend to not always have these and if you have familiar forms of Alzheimer's disease or other diseases you, you can have a beta accumulation together with alpha synucleinopathy or so but then the the filaments tend to look uh, like this and why this all is we don't understand uh, at all so I'm we're kind of just gathering data and images and, and trying to 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 understand this now in all these efforts we then also uh, found some filaments uh, and they started out in, in, in some cases of, of a rare familiar tauopathy where most of the filaments were not tau at all and we solved their structures for a few months in the lab we called them the mystery filaments because you know you have a three and a half angstrom structure it obviously wasn't tau but we had no clue what it was it wasn't until Alexei Merzin uh, who is our walking protein structure uh, encyclopedia 
Encyclopedia in the lab, Alexei uh, developed the SCOP database for classification of protein structures, perhaps some of you know, uh, but he's seen uh, many protein structures and he read this paper about this transmembrane protein called TMM106B and he re recognized there was four glycosylation sites and he kind of uh, recognized, he had recognized already previously that there were, there were four different glycosylation sites on these filaments just from kind of looking at the density and then it all clicked together and he could build the, the atomic model of TMM106B just straight bomb into the map. So, and then we, had, um, we hadn't really understood because normally these, these densities are linear. You know, you have an N-terminal part of the ordered core and then it can do whatever complicated things and then it comes out at the C-terminus. This structure appeared to be, had a cyclic kind of density in it. So we thought, oh, perhaps, you know, our reconstruction wasn't really right or so, but we hadn't kind of really found out. But then it turns out there's actually an in, intramolecular disulfide bond in the TMM106B, which beautifully uh, fit into place. So that was one of these familiar telepathies. Then we look. Then we suddenly started seeing these fil filaments in all kind of different diseases, and uh, that kind of made us worry that this would be an artifact. We then uh, ordered some control brains from the brain bank uh, of varying age, and what we saw already in Western bot with with, an with uh, antibodies against TMM106B was that all the younger controls did not have this, but some of the older controls, and this includes a 101-year-old. Uh, person who was completely cognitively healthy when he when he died of pneumonia or something or perhaps just of old age I don't know uh, but you know they also have team m 106b filaments in their brain so uh, and then we even we the, with the uh, antibody that we'd raised against the CTM domain of team m 106b we could do even ev immunohistology we could solve the same structures from older brains but not in younger brains and that kind of coincides younger brains brains don't have this pathology, whereas the older brains uh, in the, many of the disease cases, but they're all old as well, uh, and uh, the older controls, we do get these kind of, I think the neuropathologists tell me this is kind of astrocytic type of, of, uh, of inclusions. And we have one kind of odd disease case, which is a, a, a tragic case of a 15-year-old girl who had died of dementia, early onset dementia with Lewy bodies, and in that case we could not find any uh, T TMM106B filaments. So the current, we don't really know what TMM uh, assembly means, whether it, it, if you have a disease, whether it interacts with disease and makes it worse or not. You know, there, there has been some genetic risk factors for some of the TDP43 opathies, but what we do think is that TMM106B assembles as you age. So uh, how it then affects disease, we don't know, but we don't think it's the primary cause of disease. Anyway, that's a, that's a little sidetrack. So we've had this strange observation that each disease uh, is characterized by a, a different fault, and uh, this is very specific and reproducible for the different diseases. So something specific must go on at the biochemical level for these different structures to form, and we would really like to understand. So what's next? One thing uh, we can now do is we can, you know, people are quite keen to develop a positron emission tomography uh, ligands to, to, to uh, image the uh, accumulation of tau in living patients. All this you can only do from post-mortem brains. So, uh, and people are quite keen to develop uh, ligands that are specific for the different diseases. So you could hope to do sort of structure-based drug design now and kind of to show that this is possible. Yang Shi did a compound from from Apronoia uh, with and without AD filaments and you can calculate difference maps and then at quite high sigma levels you get difference density so we now kind of know where these molecules bind and, and, and the computational chemists can have a, have a field day with this. Personally, we don't really want to go into that direction. We're much more interested in the molecular mechanisms that would underlie disease. So what leads to these different filaments in disease is these cofactors or post-translation modifications, etc. We really, really like to find out. And in order to study this, there's only so much you can do with post-mortem brains. It's kind of an experimentally dead system as well because you can't perturb the experiment of, of filament formation. So we thought it would be important to go back and try to 
to do in vitro assembly with recombinant tau to be able to gain understanding on, of what is important for generating these different uh, filaments. And then ultimately what we hope is to use knowledge gained in this to then develop better cellular and, and, and uh, possibly even animal systems for the different diseases. We've looked at a, a tau mouse that, that uh, Michel has in the lab, it structures from that. It's a bit preliminary, but again, the structures look very different from any of the human diseases. So there's a problem with model systems in general in the amyloid field that because these proteins are so v structurally versatile, you, you, you don't know whether the model system you have is actually uh, the relevant one. And I'll, I'll briefly show you some some examples of that. So back already in, in 2019, when John in the lab, she did heparin induced. So you can make tau filaments recombinant in E. coli. They will be stay in solution forever. It's very soluble protein. But if you add a bit of heparin, it will readily come out of solution to form filaments. Yet the structures again looked uh, very different from any of the ones that we'd seen in disease. So uh, Sophia Leuvestam, who started in the lab as a PhD student a bit over two years ago now, set out to, to try and replicate the structure observed in Alzheimer's disease from recombinantly overexpressed protein in E. coli. And the key to this was uh, to cut off part of the N-terminal and the C-terminal fuzzy coat. So again, the, the full-length protein will, will stay in solution. And this was already known. If you, could, if you start cutting off N and C-terminals, then certain constructs will readily form um, from uh, uh, filaments. People have used constructs which are by the names of K18 and K19, which were cut right in the middle of the ordered core of AD filaments. So we already knew those would never be able to form AD filaments. But if she cut at 297 to 391, a construct also uh, investigated already before by Louise Serpo in the UK, then adapting the protocols that Louise had developed, which did not give AD, but after some tinkering around, Sophia was able to make AD filaments. To, first at, at relatively low purity, but, but again, by further optimization, she, she now can reliably, from recombinant tau, make 95% pure uh, PHF filaments in the test tube. And the structures she did then to confirm by cryon that these are indeed exactly the same structures as you see in disease. Even some of the, you know, these fuzzy densities that some people have said are post-translational modification. At least in this prep, I know for sure they're not post-translational modification because this is an E. coli, e. coli prep. They're probably just the accumulation of negatively charged phosphate ions from the buffer in front of the positively charged lysines which, which point towards these densities. That doesn't mean necessarily in disease it's not post-translation modification, but it might very well not be. Now, interestingly, if she would add certain salts to the buffer, uh, then she could get different structures. And the addition of uh, sodium chloride in specific was very interesting because then suddenly she saw type 2 filaments as were exactly the same as in uh, CTE, including the... Uh, the little density at, at, at the head of the of the protofilament fault. So then, by changing the ion, the positive ion, uh, lithium, uh, potassium, she could change the 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 shape of the structure. So you'd, it would be either the C-shaped without from Alzheimer's disease without any of these uh, monovalent cations. But if you added the monovalent cations, you would get opening up just like you, you saw in CTE and, and the different cations lead to different degrees of opening up and different uh, densities there. We then used a prototype microscope with a Falcon uh, 4 detector and a selectric sex energy filter and a cold fact in, in, in microscope uh, in Eindhoven in the Netherlands, a microscope I'll tell you more about tomorrow with the atomic resolution reconstructions that we did. But we did that now to do a 1.9 angstrom structure of these amyloids in the presence of potassium chloride. And at 1.9, you can see beautiful density for what we believe are now potassium and chloride atoms. And if you look at densities, it kind of all makes uh, more or less uh, sense. So 
that all together then makes us think that prob pr probably in the uh, sorry in the CTE like structure that we get after addition of sodium chloride this additional density here which isn't resolved to such high resolution but we now think are also pairs of, of sodium and chloride atoms now that's not proven yet but there's not much else in the buffer present it's basically a phosphate antiphosphate buffer with uh, with sodium chloride so does that mean that in CTE it's sodium chloride atoms in inside that cavity that we don't know and we've tried some experiments you know uh, positron uh, induced x-ray emission experiments with Elspeth Garman in Oxford to see you know is there more sodium or more chloride in CTE extracted filaments than in AD extracted filaments but brain samples are to some extent always dirty and we haven't been able to come to any conclusion yet but it's kind of an interesting uh, observation that in vitro just the addition of sodium chloride can change the fault from an AD fault to a CTE fault. So Sophia did an extensive search of which constructs to uh, to use for this you know is 297 and 391 are they kind of special? No on the N terminus you, you have quite a lot of flexibility on the C terminus a bit less so uh, and then interestingly if you if you either leave on the entire fuzzy coat at the C terminus or the entire fuzzy coat at the N terminus then you don't get any filaments as you would have with full length tau but if you then in the C terminus she'd looked at the paper by Judith Steen who would use mass spec to identify post translation modifications that occur on tau in Alzheimer's disease and she said oh there's these four that I would like to look at so she made phosphomimetic mutations of her tau construct on the C terminus and then she could get filaments from the from the full C terminus construct just by including these uh, four uh, mutations and they don't form PHFs but they do they do adopt the C-shaped protofilament fold from Alzheimer's disease but they come together in different ways or they stay a uh, single protofilament so not yet beautiful PHS but we now think that post translational modifications in the fuzzy code can actually affect what type of structures you form in the ordered core and this is something I mentioned to you this morning chat where I think you know it would be great to look with with nuclear, nuclear magnetic residence you know what what do these kind of alterations of the of the sequence mean in terms of what, what happens to the fuzzy code now in doing all this Sophia managed to solve 76 different structures in the span of uh, one year and these are some of the structures that are all different from any of the disease related structures we had observed before so this is all tau all assembled in vitro different construct different pHs and salts etc uh, just to kind of bring home to you the the observation that proteins have evolved with their amino acid sequence to adopt one fold or perhaps no fold with with intrinsically disordered proteins like tau but the same is not true for amyloids you know there is not a, this is the amyloid structure of this protein I think is the wrong way of thinking about it because the same protein can adopt many many different conformations so uh, that took her quite a while to submit that all that to the EMDB and she's provided some feedback on how that process could be improved but it kind of shows that what we now call high throughput cryoEM and I don't want to put numbers on how many you can do per time unit but you know we've now reached a stage where just solving a cryoEM structure is no longer the main goal of a project it becomes a tool that you can repeatedly use in in a project to find out certain uh, questions which as I think as the techniques mature is where we really want to get to so that brings me to my uh, conclusion slides amyloids are structurally versatile if there's only one thing you want to remember please remember that uh, but despite that observation in disease something highly specific happens and I think it's very important that we find out why and how that this happens if we are to kind of understand the molecular mechanisms of disease hopefully in the end being able to intervene in the, in the process of disease so 
in vitro assembly is starting to yield insights there. I think Sophia's work is, a, is an exciting start, but there is a lot more to be done. And high throughput cryo-EM will be, uh, continue to be a very important tool. We're also starting to use uh, NMR ourselves now, and uh, I've, I've alluded to some of these things already. So where does this then lead to? What I hope is that we'll, from these in vitro studies, we'll be able to gain knowledge. You know, it's these type of post-translational modifications or these types of cells which have these types of molecules where you get done these types of filaments, that this type of knowledge ultimately will lead us to better cellular model systems and ultimately better animal model systems, that we can have model systems that reflect what happens in the different diseases better. Then we can start to do, you know, screen for ways of, of how to intervene in those. Cool. That brings me to my acknowledgement slide. All this, as I said, is done in close collaboration with Michel. He's partially covered by Akis here. Um, so all these people we, we work with together on, on a daily basis. And uh, Abhay Kutecha at Thermo Fisher Scientific in Eindhoven uses kind of this case as, as for their company to prove, you know, the high throughput cryo-EM, that's what the pharma companies all want and want to invest in. So he uses our samples. So I think Sophia this week is sending Abhay and another 100 samples and he'll put it on his scope and, and, and go all, all the way automatically through. So uh, we collaborate with a lot of people who provide us with these brain tissues, so a lot of neuropathologists or, or samples already purified from brain tissues and without those people we couldn't do any of this work. So I thank you very much for your attention and we'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Shoth. Uh, that was great. And, and thank you to the audience for not rioting at the phrase American football. <laughs> um, so uh, has anyone got any questions they would like to ask? Yeah. Um, beautiful lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, one of the features that to me is, is, is hard to understand is that between protofilaments, you have several examples where the surface area of contact is extremely small, mm. right? Yet these appear to be stable two filament structures. Are there any insights into what is stabilizing that and how, I mean, because it's a very small steric zipper or maybe a few hydrogen bonds, how can that hold together two large filaments? Do you understand that? Not really, no. And it's very specific as well. So for example, the Alzheimer fold, we've now, if you looked in detail, some of the structures that Sophia did, there was quite a few which have something akin to the Alzheimer fold, but many of them pack against each other very differently. For example, this KCL structure had like a trimer rather than a dimer, and, and we have no clue why that is. And so the interactions between them, you're right, some of them are very, seem very weak. You know, PHF is, is just backbone kind of interactions, possibly a bit of hydrophobic interactions. They're quite tightly packed again. The distance between them is very small because there's this through some glycines, but why that is so strong that you always see these PHFs? Because we, we don't see any single protofilaments in, in tau, in, of tau in Alzheimer's brain, for example. And, and so you don't have sufficient resolution to see if the main chain exchanges between the two filaments. It doesn't. No. It doesn't? Okay. Huh. We do have the resolution yeah. to see that, yeah. So I'm, I'm curious about the variability among tau amino acid sequences across the human population. And if you've explored these, this variation with respect to variation in structure. Yeah, so there are some mutations in tau, they're quite rare, but you have familiar forms of neurodegeneration which are caused by mutations in the tau gene. So there are some uh, of these intron mutations which lead to different splicing and probably they just lead to more four repeat tau isoforms relative to three repeat, that seems to lead to disease and some of the structures we did were from some of those cases. I think the familiar British and Danish are also d 
mutations that are at least not in the ordered core. But uh, and that, but then there is one residue P301, so that's in in repeat two. That's kind of a, a famous one. So you can have that mutate to uh, S or to L or to T, and then you get uh, neurodegeneration, which is familial. Uh, now, the Michel's mouse model, which I mentioned, is actually a P301S mouse model because of tau itself being quite soluble, not easily to form filaments in vitro. But if you mutate P301 to S, L, or T, you get a spontaneous formation of recombinant tau in vitro. And a lot of model systems use this. You know, Mark Diamond has these biosensor cells which you can put some filaments at the outside and then they get taken up and you get massive amplification of amyloids inside the cells. It's kind of used as a readout for infectivity and so on. So those are based all on the P301S system. But Michel's P301S mouse, we did the structure now of, we haven't published it yet, we're writing it up, but the structure is again different from any of the other diseases. Now we don't have uh, human brains of P301S because I don't think there's any available anymore, but we do now have P301L and P301T brains and again that's not published yet but they're they're probably different again from the p301s mouse and different from the things we've seen before although the, you know it's not completely finished yet that work so yes so you see all these different form you've seen all these different forms now that you haven't been able to link to disease do you think that there those diseases exist somewhere or there's some reason why uh, those cannot form Informed disease is that a yeah I got that question a lot so I think you know people do experiments in vitro and we all wish they were relevant but I think just some experiments we do in vitro are not relevant so uh, there is not that many tauopathies left to do I can't exclude that some of the structures we will find we have stumbled on, on in, in, in our in vitro work but I suspect that most of the structures I showed on one of my last slides by Sophia are all artifacts okay. Here. So uh, you showed uh, two struct or two different uh, isoforms of tau fibrils in CTE. Were those uh, in two different isoforms within the same uh, no, brain no, of patients? No, no, two different or? protofilaments. Oh, two pr okay, no, two, two different filament types, and the protofilament structure mm -hmm. is always the same. So that's okay. that's something that not in MSA, but in all the tauopathies, we often see at least two different types of filaments, but they usually arise from different interprotofilament packings with a common fold of the protofilament. So were those both found in the same the same brain or among okay Yes, so we looked at three different brains mm -hmm. and uh, two of them had both types and then in one of them we only could see type 1. Okay, do you have an, any idea of why that might be the case? No. Okay. No. So different types of filaments ratios do vary. Uh, for MSA, for example, we have two different types and we have some individuals with only one and other individuals with only the other. And that's kind of interesting. We, we could use that for in vitro seeded assembly. And you know, you've probably seen the, the paper where we could then get different seeded reactions of the different types. And it's the only way we now have now, now to be able to separate them was the luck to have found an individual with only type one or with only type two. So have you been able to get any information on um, structural heterogeneity along one filament? I guess I'm particularly thinking at the ends and if the the ends <laughs> kind of look like the middle. Yeah, so the type of averaging that we do kind of precludes us from much to looking into that much because the averaging we do assumes that each of these layers is exactly the same. So if you want to study the structure at the end, you would have to let go of helical symmetry uh, and the number of particles you would have would tumble down quite uh, dramatically because then each end is, is unique, right? Mm -hmm. So we haven't really tried to do that, but uh, yeah, one could in principle try. I can go around this edge. I always get good exercise doing these. <laughs>
Hello. Um, so this feels like kind of a dumb question, but towards the end, you're talking about the role of potentially post-translational modifications, um, promoting that assembly of aggregation and filamentation. But I was wondering if, would it be possible that the presence of a filament themselves could be promoting more filaments to be formed and then the post-translational modifications are just being signaled to tend to that. Yeah, so the presence of filament definitely promotes more filaments to be formed. So that's the whole kind of underlying principle of this prion-like seeded uh, aggregation, right? Um, for example, I, I already alluded to it. So for alpha synuclein, we did that experiment where we took different cases with MSA and took a little bit of the brain uh, extract, the purified alpha synuclein filaments from brain to add it to recombinant alpha synuclein. And under the experimental conditions that we chose, the recombinant protein on its own would not assemble. But you add a bit, then that acts as a seed of which you get growth of the filaments. And then you, that's the kind of thing what I said, you know, they could break and you get exponential growth. So you, if you add tiny amounts of seeds, you then get very rapid assembly of the recombinant alpha synuclein. But Sophia did the structure of the products of those, and if you use the case which only had these type 2 MSA filaments, she could kind of replicate half of the structure. So we think that also here there is a cofactor in the middle that may have been missing from our in vitro assembly reaction because we don't know what it is, which could be an explanation why we only get half of the structure. But for other cases which have mixtures of, of, of the type 1 and the type 2, we we then got all these structures here shown in green and, and, and blue, which are very different from the actual structures of the seeds that we put in. So yes, the addition of filaments accelerates growth, but it's not necessarily along the type of mechanisms that people have thought that you get templated seeding of the same structure that then faithfully replicates what you get in vitro. That doesn't m mean that if others don't repeat the experiment under different conditions, they also don't succeed. I'm just saying we didn't succeed, so it, it could happen that you don't succeed. That's as fast as I move. <laughs> I was interested in this heparin catalyzed um, filament formation in vitro. So is that also, does the heparin also required in the presence of the different salts? Are those still heparin catalyzed? in the in vitro system. Oh, so all of the structures Sophia did, there was no heparin. There was no heparin. No heparin, because if you add heparin, heparin is beautiful. It's very long kind of polymeric-like molecules with lots of negative charges. Right. What you think is all the lysines on the, on the tau sequence of the ordered course, kind of, you kind of get an anthropic effect where you, it acts as a glue along the helical axis, kind of keeping everything together. So there is, again, fuzzy densities on the outsides of the cores of the heparin structure which suggest that heparin binds kind of and, and forms like a ruler on which to build. So it becomes so a structural component. If you add a little bit of heparin yeah. to anything, it will assemble like crazy. So, so it's so like there's a... There's no heparin in the brain. Right, but there is, but heparin is, is basically a nucleic acid analog and it's structure. Yeah, there's so other molecules in the brain which could... Can, has anybody tried just adding nucleic acid? instead of heparin. Yeah, so you can add RNA as well. Yeah. So we did the structure of that. Too. I don't think we, it's published yet, but it's, it's again a different structure. No, I think one of the structures... And what RNA was it? Oh, I don't remember. Yeah. <laughs> some, some uh, probably something, but... Uh, but potentially yeah. that could be acting as a seed in, the, in cells. Yeah, so people have hypothesized that binding of RNA to these filaments could could promote growth, yep. etc. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, and and it does so in vitro. What role it plays in disease, I don't I don't know. Yeah. Okay, um, one more, and then uh, I think <laughs> we've had a stop. Thanks. <clears throat> yeah, I, I wanted to follow up on Dave's questions about the in vitro work. I'm, I'm curious how stable those structures are, or can they be disassembled? And can you add a different salt and then reassemble them in a different structure? Have you so done anything all these like amyloids are quite 
Some of them are very stable. And and some even of them, in vitro, you can't reverse yeah, the them in, in vitro. Yeah, the in vitro ones, most of them are also quite... Uh, we haven't done extensive studies on all of them because at some point, you know, there's too, life is too short and there's too many experiments you could do. But uh, the ones in disease, for example, you, you can bo if you boil them, you can take them apart and you boil them in SDS, you can get monomers on... But you can add salts so. to them and, and But just adding salts, they structure. wouldn't come apart. So I think what Sophia did try was, you know, she has a structure with salt, formed with salt and without salt. So she used those as seeds in the conditions of the contrary experiment. So she used the salt formed structures to seed aggregation without salt and she used the the non-salt containing structures in seeded aggregation with salt. And I think one of those experiments did replicate the same structures, but the other experiment did not replicate the structure of the seed, but the rep replicated the structure of the condition. But I, I'm sorry, I forgot which, which way around it was. Yes, early days, yes. Okay, um, thank you very much. Let's all... Uh, yeah. So there, there is now a reception outside as well, so.